Uh, thanks for joining us again. Another sultry night uh, uh, in uh, in New England, and I'm kind of excited. We actually have a local author, um, uh, Toby Pearls from Lexington. So I don't have to explain to her how wet it's been around here. She's 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 happy that it's not raining by her too. So. Um, um, before we get started, a couple of things. Um, as you know, all our talks are brought to us by Cape Cod Five, uh, First Citizens Federal Credit Union, and Martha's Vineyard Savings. Uh, all the books on our, um, our our list are available at Eight Cousins Bookseller, so we hope that you um, uh, go visit the locals. And a note, um, if you're watching the, uh, the PowerPoint, uh, you will notice that uh, we're going to try our first hybrid talk next week, Tuesday, a week from today, um, as I was telling Toby that uh, we're going to try to put, uh, we're dipping our toe in the water. So if you want to come in person, the author will be there. We're, we're also going to do it by Zoom. So you, whichever way you're comfortable, we're going to give it a whirl. So um, we're, we're slowly trying to get back, but I'm, as, uh, but I'm also, I'm, uh, I'm aware of the uh, COVID rates rising in places like Provincetown. So I don't want to put anybody at risk here. So um, just to want to make note of that. Um, our author tonight, as I mentioned, is, is from Lexington. Toby Pearl earned degrees in law and international relations from Boston University. And I can guarantee she's the first person we've ever had uh, in, in, our, um, in our series that's ever gotten, uh, uh, that's ever studied international law at the University of Hong Kong. Uh, Terror to the Wicked is our first book. And would you welcome our guest tonight, Toby Pearl. Thank you so much for that warm welcome. And I'm very excited to um, share this kind of hidden moment in history with everyone who's um, tuning in this evening. And um, thank you for tuning in and showing up for history. I know um, some beautiful weather is beckoning and it is gorgeous, I'm sure, on the Cape. And um, so I can certainly understand the pull of being elsewhere, but I'm excited to kind of journey back um, to the year 1638 and um, to a series of really remarkable events that took place not far from um, where uh, listeners on the Cape are. And um, I'll go into the location a little bit. I'll start by sharing how I came across this history and kind of what inspired me and compelled me to um, take up a pen and start um, writing a book about these events that were so incredible. Um, so to start with, I'll just share in a nutshell kind of um, the events I'm referring to. In 1638, outside of Plymouth Colony, um, a group of four escaped indentured servants who had fled Plymouth Colony were out in the woods alongside a trail, a pathway, and um, they were fleeing the colony and their servitude. And they encountered a, um, an American Indian man, a trader who was on a trading mission. And this man's name was Pinawan Yanquis and they murdered him. And this event, uh, led to a remarkable manhunt and um, America's first significant jury trial. And as an attorney, as someone who served as a juror, I became absolutely engrossed with the events. And I was struck by Plymouth Colony's um, the colony and between the other colonies and also the conversations that were had with indigenous leaders and communities about the buildup to this trial. And it, there was no kind of foregone conclusion um, that the manhunt would have been successful, that the trial um, would have been held successfully. Uh, the population of Plymouth Colony at the time was relatively small, about 550 people and uh, many people were excluded from jury service. So indentured servants, and we can talk a little bit about exactly what indentured servants were, what their lives were like, were excluded from jury service as were um, young people, women, um, people who held um, a position of power in the colony. Um, and indentured servants made up about 17% of the colony. So there were a lot of people who were excluded from jury service. And um, 
it was none other, to back up a little bit, it was none other than Roger Williams, the founder of Providence, Rhode Island, who found the murder victim, Pinawan Yanquist, by, by this wooded path. Um, and um, at the time, Pinawan Yanquist, the murder victim, was still alive. And he lived long enough to tell Roger Williams um, to name his killers and identify them, which is what launched the manhunt. But um, the amount of worry and conversation and discussion between Roger Williams and um, other colony leaders about the daunting prospect of trying to stage America's first significant murder trial, um, especially given that this was a time of war. Um, so in 1638, the Pequot War was unfolding. The Pequot War was fought primarily between Mass Bay Colony soldiers. So if you think of present day Boston, Massachusetts, and the Pequot, um, which if you think geographically of present day Connecticut, and there was ferocious fighting that unfolded during that war. And um, there was every concern that this murder um, that was not connected to the war, but nonetheless could spark, um, reignite the fighting that was unfolding um, during this two year Pequot War that lasted from uh, 1636, ending in September, 1638. And the murder victim, Pinoan Yanquis, was a Nipmuc tribesman. So, Many local folks might be familiar with the Nipmuc and may have even visited um, Hassan Emesset in uh, Grafton, Massachusetts, and um, which is the Nipmuc stronghold. And um, Penawan Yanquis was allied with the Narragansett. So the dynamics, there were many players who had um, many complicated interests and concerns at play and at stake. Um, that were tied up in this murder. And I'll just pause for a second here to kind of backtrack a little bit um, because I know I promised I would tell you why and how it came to be that um, I picked up my pen across the story and started writing about it. Um, at the time I came across these events, I um, had given up um, practicing as an attorney and um, having worked as a legal advocate um, and I was a stay-at-home mom, and I um, was actually becoming more interested in um, my family's genealogy, and uh, my husband and I had just welcomed our third child, and as a holiday gift, my husband, um, who's also an author, uh, Matthew Pearl, um, a novelist and also a nonfiction writer, um, gave me a membership to NHGS, which is New England Historic Genealogical Society in Boston, Massachusetts, right in the city. And it is a world-class research resource. But at the time, the membership was just to kind of trace my personal family history. And I knew I had these deep roots um, right around Plymouth and actually um, out on the Cape and Falmouth and those areas too. But I didn't know very much about that history. And I was curious to kind of start digging. And um, what started as a holiday gift to kind of trace back my great grandparents and, and their parents beyond them um, to kind of share some of this um, personal narrative with my own children um, quickly became much more. I realized that my um, many times back great grandfather was the one time uh, served, well, several times, but as governor of Plymouth Colony, um, Governor Thomas Prince. And at the time of these events, the murder trial, one of the first significant trials in the country, he was governor and presided over this trial. And um, I, I, that caught my attention um, and I was curious. And then the more I learned about the trial and the murder and the manhunt. I just couldn't believe that I hadn't really um, heard much about these events before. And we have so many narratives and, and sometimes kind of we talk about our, our flawed um, national origin story and trying to pull out a more complete story. And I wanted to do my best to do that in writing this book and I wanted it um, because I'm really, first and foremost, a reader. I love to read books. I wanted this book um, to read 
like a page turner. And these events truly were so gripping that that wasn't the hard part. Um, that started to unfold pretty quickly. It was the research that became not difficult, but engrossing. Um, it was hard not to become kind of obsessed because I was in the perfect spot to do all of the research. There's so many wonderful um, uh, mass historic um, society and the archives on the South Shore and um, uh, Registry of Deeds actually holds the Plymouth Colony records, which are um, the original documents that document this trial. And I actually, um, maybe right now, this is a good segue to kind of move over to my slideshow. I'll just go quickly through some of the slides so that you can see um, some of the images from the book and kind of um, anchor these details a little bit with some visuals. Um, but I'll just add one last thing. The reason this attempt at a jury trial was so um, important to me, I think at a time where sometimes we talk about what is a democracy, what is important about our democracy, um, these foundational building blocks of our democracy, how much can we push and pull at them? And why is it so, what is the imperative to hang on to them at all, all costs? What's at risk? And this jury trial kind of answered all of those questions. This was, in my view, kind of America's first foray into democracy. Um, there were many other uh, norms of democracy at the time that did not exist. And we think about free speech or voting rights or the right to carry arms. Those things were heavily restricted or privileges that were restricted. Um, but this right to a jury trial was fundamental. And it was fundamental because people had been fleeing England where they were persecuted for their religious beliefs, branded, um, faced tyranny, the whim of someone in power being able to throw you into a dungeon without a safeguard um, to prevent that kind of terrifying injustice. And the one right that people cared so much about was the right to a jury trial. And it was because it was the ultimate safeguard of last resort against tyranny. It meant no one who didn't like what you said or didn't like what you did could just throw you into prison without any recourse. And the recourse was that 12 of your peers would stand up and weigh the evidence and that would be a safeguard against the tyranny of one. So it's a, a very uh, now American idea and it was one um, enacted in 1638 and it was, it was pretty incredible. I'm going to do my best at this point to share my screen with you. This is, I'm not very tech savvy. Um, see. I hope you can see my screen, maybe. Let's see. Hmm, I can see you, but I think you cannot see my screen. So no, we, we can see the screen. Oh, can you see my slideshow? Yeah. Okay. All right. Let me see if I can just enlarge it. Let's see. Should be loading. Let's give it a second. Okay. All right. Good. So you should be able to see. This is uh, the cover of my book, Terror to the Wicked, and what you're seeing there is um, a, a horrific event in America's history, and one that's not often spoken about. And I feel like people are a little bit more familiar with King Philip's War, um, but aren't very familiar with the Pequot War and there were terrible atrocities that occurred during the Pequot War. And this is an etching, an image of one of them. This is the Mystic Fort Massacre. And you can see um, this was an attack on an indigenous Pequot um, settlement that was enclosed by, you can see this defensive structure. It looks like a fence. It was called a palisade at the time. It was um, 
a defensive battle structure to keep soldiers out. And um, but Mass Bay Colony soldiers did in, indeed break the battle lines and get in to the fort, and they lit it on fire. And um, there were elderly and um, children in this uh, fort. So you can see kind of up close this horror of the Pequot War that was unfolding in 1638. And um, again, the Pequot War began in 1638. Things were starting to slow down, or 1636 rather. By 1638, things were starting to slow down. But the concern at the time, um, and uh, I think it was William Bradford, former uh, Plymouth Colony governor, um, raised the issue that if this murder and these events weren't handled correctly, um, the concern largely widely held was that it was going to raise the war yet again um, as it was still upholding. Um, here's just a list of uh, the people who feature most prominently in my um, nonfiction narrative. And you'll see Penawan Yanquist's name, the murder victim, the Nipmuc traitor, Arthur Peach, is the accused killer. He was Edward Winslow's indentured servant. And um, so I, I did quite a bit of research out in Marshfield and um, it really kind of showcases a lot of the Plymouth Colony originals and some of the uh, Mayflower originals. So if that's of interest, um, they're kind of all here. Um, Roger Williams, founder of Providence, Rhode Island, who encountered Pinawan Yanquis as he lay dying. And the last person um, I'll highlight right here is named Will. And he was Roger Williams' young American Indian slave. And with the Pequot War, there were prisoners of war, and there were Pequot who were sent out and sold into slavery, um, which began in New England in 1638 in earnest. And there were young Pequot children who were placed out if they were young enough um, into people's homes. And we have Roger Williams' letter still in existence to um, Governor John Winthrop of Mass Bay Colony requesting this particular little Pequot boy. And um, he identifies him, he describes him um, by a particular marking and requests that Will come to present day Providence, Rhode Island and live in the Williams home. And when I first began researching these events, I didn't know that Will existed. I didn't know that he was a part of the story, but my research some deep research over many years led me to revealing his role in these um, remarkable events. And he had a role I could never have even imagined. Um, he was pivotal to catching the killers. And what we know is that Roger Williams sent his servant out to pursue after the killers into the woods as they absconded. And we know that Will was the servant living in Roger Williams' home at the time. And Will, I estimate, was probably about 11 years old. Um, otherwise, he would have risked um, the threat of being sent out into slavery abroad, death. Um, so we know Will must have been relatively young. And all of the documentation about this trial and the manhunt to find the killers referenced a messenger. And for the first stretch during my research, you know, I kind of, I, I noted that there was a messenger. I envisioned an adult, um, likely a man, um, but it was one of my research goals to uncover exactly who that person was. And as someone with children in this age group, when I realized who it was and how old he was and the horror that he had already gone through and um, that he did indeed find success in helping to apprehend these killers, it became um, the most unexpected and um, kind of shocking part of the whole research and the whole book and a, a piece of the book and the history that I hadn't even anticipated at the outset. So um, it was interesting for me as a researcher to see how that could evolve 
um, that the research could kind of continue to um, shed light on these events from so long ago, almost 400 years ago. Um, I, and last person I'll mention here is Massasoit Usamequin, um, Sachem of the Wampanoag at the time, um, likely a familiar name to um, who are familiar with the Wampanoag. And um, Massasoit played a significant role in this jury trial. He sat down with Roger Williams and debated um, Arthur Peach, um, the accused killer, Arthur Peach's guilt. And if Arthur Peach was guilty, should all four men be gu guilty? Um, and had kind of a lengthy um, discussion of kind of legal back and forth with Roger Williams debating that, and that's recorded by Roger Williams. So there's just a tremendous amount of interesting history here. Um, I'll keep going. Um, this is my pride and joy. This is a map that Bill and Kristen Keegan, um, their historical geographers, kindly donated for the book. And um, their generosity is astounding because the man hours and woman hours by Bill and Kristen um, to create this map. They go into archives and recreate. Um, for those of you who I know are familiar with the area, you'll notice the coastline might look a little different. You'll see footpaths um, that crisscross that were used. And um, there's kind of, I don't know if you can see this little oval shape, but that's exactly where the murder took place off the footpath. Um, uh, Penawan Yanquist had been heading to the Uptexit trading post. Um, with his wares, and then he was attacked on his return route. Um, so here's the remarkable map that's included in the book. Um, here's an image of um, present day um, Plymouth Patuxet, I think is the updated name. And um, here's an image, an oil painting of the Mayflower Compact. Um, it's a beautiful painting. And we can see um, Miles Standish, who um, kind of played a role in Plymouth Colony on the military front in his um, military gear, his helmet. And we have uh, Edward Winslow standing behind this chest, the Mayflower Compact being signed. Edward Winslow, again, Arthur Peach's uh, master. So a lot of the Historical figures who are featured in the book are seen right there in that moment. Um, so we don't have an image of Will. I wonder a lot about him. Um, this is, researchers have, academics have revealed that this is a fellow Pequot tribesman from the period in which Will lived. And that's um, a beautiful painting. This is one of the few portraits of um, someone from the period. This is John Winthrop, Mass Bay Colony Governor, so present day Boston. And um, this is a wonderful photograph that uh, the photographer, Dennis Downs, was kind enough to share with me. It's an um, every single historical figure in the book, whether it was a man, a child, a woman, um, an indigenous person, a settler, uh, a political leader, or um, an indentured servant, um, because there were so many groups of people and they were all individuals and um, they each represent a, a significant kind of puzzle piece of, of, of this history of piecing this together. And I wanted to kind of do my best to create a full portrait of, of everyone who um, was involved in these remarkable events. And um, indigenous marker trees were kind of cultivated to create certain shapes and um, could be used to guide people through the woods. So um, there were a lot of details I tried to share to um, show objects that Penwan Yanquist, the murder victim, might have been familiar with in, in his walk through the woods, things that would have stood out and um, that he would have had knowledge of. This is a Nitbuk Manitou stone that would have had spiritual meaning. Um, I um, studied closely the, um, there's a wonderful book called Manitou 
And um, one of the things that I learned were was that um, within indigenous languages spoken in this region at the time, um, you know, we think about certain romance languages as having male or female and um, in indigenous languages, things were kind of alive or not and stones were spoken about as living things. And um, that was a revelation for me to learn more of this history. Um, I wanted to do my best as an outsider who was not Nipmuc, um, but trying to uh, work my way and share research. Um, but I quickly encountered um, Larry Spotted Crow Man's work. He has written extensively about Nipmuc culture and he's opened a Nipmuc cultural institution, a, a place, um, a learning research resource and cultural resource, um, okeet2.org. And um, his website is whisperingbasket.com. And you can check out um, his wonderful writing, um, Drumming and Dreaming is one of my favorites of his books. And there's Nipmuc Nation um, pre-pandemic. They have a powwow at the end of last weekend every July. And um, that's something that I always made a point of, of going to and visiting. Um, this is an image that's included in my book. And this is kind of really what set me on my journey. It's the 1623 order mandating the use of jury trials in Plymouth Colony. It was written out by Governor William Bradford at a time of terrible um, conditions in Plymouth Colony and uh, limited resources, limited food, you know, things were certainly improving, but um, it such a difficult survival situation, someone would sit down and have the forethought to order the use of jury trials. And um, I have quoted below these words, a jury upon their oaths. Um, and you can see it in kind of this top paragraph, last line of that paragraph. And, um, and that's kind of what set in motion all of these events. And that document is at Plymouth County Registry of Deeds today. Um, so it was still there. And I think that might be the end of our slideshow. I'm going to try and there, eliminate our slideshow. Um, I think we're doing okay for time. If, um, if that's okay, I will quickly read a brief passage from my book. Um, this is about the moment of the murder. And it kind of also shares um, a moment of parallel research that I um, utilized in the book. So I'll, I'll quickly read this. Um, and then maybe we can have, if anyone has any questions, we can open it up for um, questions. Um, so this is the chapter um, from my book called Murder. And this is um, details through tremendous research, um, exactly kind of what Panawanya was, was facing. Adrenaline surely rising, Panawanya was sprinted and tripped through the warm murky water farther into the depths of the swamp. Thick clumps of impenetrable reeds sliced his ankles. The injuries erupted in blinding pain. Blood gushed from his stomach wounds into dark liquid clouds around him as his body sank. One last time, Panawanya was heard them close by him and tried to elude his pursuers. He ventured even farther into the swamp till he fell down again when they lost him quite. Pinawan Yanquist himself was likely quite lost at this point and critically injured. He prayed for help. The dense vegetation obscured the sun and any means of navigation and the enormous lush leaves of stinking skunk cabbage plants underfoot emitted an unpleasant dizzying heat. Penamon Yanquist left no record of the hours he spent hiding in the swamp, but a fellow Algonquin man born in the 18th century wrote about the panic he himself felt after getting lost in a similar impassable environment. Shut out from the light of heaven, surrounded by appalling darkness, standing on uncertain ground and having proceeded so far that to return, if possible, were as dangerous as to go over. This was the hour of peril. I could not call for assistance on my fellow creatures. There was no mortal ear to listen to my cry. I was shut out from the world and did not know but that I should perish there. 
and my fate forever remain a mystery to my friends. And so it was for Pinawan Yanquis. He was out of reach of Peach's rapier, but he remained lost, injured, and disoriented in a nightmarish scene. Time and, and this excerpt from my book. And if anyone does have any questions, I'm happy um, to do my best to answer them. Thank you, Toby. Um, that was great. Um, uh, in your book, you talk about, um, I'm, I'm, I'm never going to get his name right, Penawanankis, Peno right? Uh, yeah. Um, he's attacked in the woods. He's a Nipmunk trader. He's on his way uh, to the uh, Pepsin um, trading post, as you said. And, but before he dies, he makes his way to Roger Williams. Is that, so that he, he confesses to Roger Williams? Is that the way it it's a little bit um, more complicated. So he um, takes off for the swamp, um, tries to lose his captors in this swamp that to this day um, exists in this, in this area. Um, at the time, um, and I know this from a small volume of, of history that was written um, over a hundred years ago, but um, in centuries past, there existed a small island within, within the swamp, and I think he might have made it out to this island and spent the night there. Um, but he did indeed elude his pursuers, and there were four of them. And um, once he made it out there, he was able to escape from <clears throat> these murderers. And it seems like at the break of day, he was able to drag himself back to the footpath. And that is when a group of uh, Narragansett men discovered him and went to find Roger Williams and let him know. And um, one person did indeed go into uh, the home of Roger Williams and um, shared that this shocking um, attempted murder had happened in the woods. And Roger Williams goes ahead and gathers um, two other settlers, um, one who had some pretty significant for the time medical training, and they trekked out to Penawan Yanquis. And I estimate this to be about 10 miles from the home of Roger Williams to the site of the attack. And um, it's, it's funny, at the time, the map makers I was uh, working with said, you know, it's probably not 10 miles, that seems a bit, um, a bit much, maybe something less than that. But at the end of the map making, they thought, yeah, it probably was about 10 miles because they had to kind of work their way up around um, the water and back down. Um, what they did was they transported the dying Pinwan Yanquis back to Providence. And um, one of the exceptions to the hearsay rule in law is the dying declaration. And the idea there is usually you don't share something that someone else told you as evidence, but if someone's on their deathbed, truth. And this was kind of this early example of a very dramatic dying declaration of um, Penamon Yanquis identifying his killers and saying it was these four men who were out in the woods, they attacked me and they tried to kill me. And then he passed away not much after that. Um, there's one more kind of twist um, in this remarkable story, um, as, as you all will know, in a murder trial to secure conviction, it's very important to have a body. And at some point um, after the Stein Declaration, and with these grave wounds, Penawan Yanquis disappears, his body disappears, and that remains a mystery. And we have um, testimony provided at trial saying that there is no way Penawan Yanquis could have survived these wounds, but it's kind of a dramatic twist um, that does uh, unfold at trial about um, where is the body in terms of the defense at trial. Um, Roger Williams sends a, a search party out. They find Arthur Peach and the other three. Um, obviously, the population was much smaller, so we're looking for four guys. 
Um, how long does it take? Uh, and and what's is this a definition of a hate crime? I mean, what 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 were the motivation? What they just didn't like a nip mug traitor? Is that is that what it comes down to? Well, you know, 1630 is kind of this interesting moment in um, Plymouth Colony's history. And you have these lengthy indenture contracts expiring and not many people eager to sign up to replace the indentured servants. And you also have indentured servants treated poorly, um, promised huge land grants that keep kind of getting diminished over the years. Um, so you have people who are kind of disenfranchised and looking to escape, which is what Arthur Peach did. He left his indenture behind. And Arthur Peach had also served as a soldier in the Pequot War, and he was noted for his service in the Pequot War. And he had that history behind him. And um, an indigenous man in that period would have had a tremendous amount of freedom compared to an indentured servant who is not free to kind of come and go. And I did kind of puzzle over a little bit. You know, I, I wonder, um, on one hand, it was a very, um, the motivation appeared very clear. Um, you have Arthur Peach, poor, starving, um, out in the woods, lost, not doing particularly well, trying um, to leave Plymouth Colony and, and barely making it very far. Um, and you have Penamonianquis, a successful trader mission, carrying a tremendous amount of wampum. And we know pretty much exactly how much wampum he was carrying because we know how many beaver pelts he traded and it was recorded how many, how much wampum he had. And we know kind of um, how that translates into um, the quantity of wampum it translates into. So. Uh, in my book, I kind of compare him to someone leaving a bank with a bag of gold or coins, you know, wampum would have rattled as he moved, as would have a bag of, of gold if you were leaving a bank. He was a very tempting target. He was by himself carrying something of tremendous value. Um, so Peach's motivation could have been as simple as that. But I do wonder, and certainly some of Peach's recorded words, and it's, it's pretty remarkable, remarkable that almost 400 years later, we have some of Peach's words recorded about this, um, display a, a level of animosity, if, if not hatred, toward this man simply because of who he is. So it's interesting you raise this idea of kind of, could we see this within the context of a hate crime? And, and I, I certainly think it's possible and um, I think if memory serves, we have Peach say, saying to his um, other gang members, you know, hang him rogue, I've killed many others. And it's um, kind of this, this um, telling language. Um, Peach was Edward Winslow's indentured servant. Was to your research, was he, maltreated um what what was it what was he um indentured what was the length of his indenture what was he learning to do and when was he poorly treated which is why he wanted to leave right we do have um lots of evidence about other indentured servants some who completed their indenture and then kind of slowly built up a life um and things went pretty smoothly we have examples in the historical record about indentured servants who um, were beaten, and I um, go into a little bit of detail about one who passed away from his beatings. Um, so it kind of ran the gamut. And um, in terms of Peach's experience, there's nothing to indicate that he was treated um, violently or anything of that nature. Um, but what we do know about Peach is that he impregnated a female servant, Dorothy Temple, and there were not very many female indentured servants at the time. Um, and we know that she was um, his same age. And um, we know that the fact that she was pregnant um, kind of revealed her to tremendous castigation, um, social, 
um, actual, she was whipped. Um, it put her in a terrible situation. So fleeing Plymouth Colony, um, whether or not he knew about that pregnancy at the time, um, he was already kind of walking this um, fine line in terms of a Puritan um, settlement of um, engaging in behaviors that would have been harshly and physically punished. And um, so he was contending with all of that. So it's, it's not a huge surprise that he would have chafed at those restrictions and left. And, you know, Arthur Peach kind of presents this terrible case, but we can think to indentured servants um, more broadly who weren't allowed to get married, who didn't have any rights in that regard. And they were all young um, people who were probably, you know, um, falling in love and would have wanted to date or marry or start a family and they were not allowed to. So you had this kind of constant friction of um, young people who for terms of seven plus years were unable to start families, even if they wanted to within that kind of puritanical context and were punished um, when they failed to meet these kind of impossible standards. So they have their own scarlet letter situation going on. Yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. We see the origins of that. Yeah, exactly. Um, you can tell from your book and from your talk that Will seems to be your hero of this. How do you come across him? And without giving away everything, talk about his role. It took a lot of research. And um, I'm very lucky that there is um, so much documentation about Roger Williams and so many resources available where I was able to really kind of dive into his Roger Williams and his life. And um, he was prolific. He was a huge letter writer, and he he really is someone who, from everything I've read of his personal writings, you know, someone who, um, while he had enemies, and <laughs> he certainly had people who really, really, really disliked him, um, he was um, able to kind of build bridges with um, broken relationships and um, get back on kind of solid social footing, even after having been banished from Mass Bay Colony. And um, so it's through some of his letters to Winthrop, for example, um, that he details um, information about Will. Um, but it's tricky when you're doing this research, you know, it's not that these things are kind of spelled out, you know, now that all the pieces have fallen into place, it's clear to me, but you know, the letters about Will are from a different period of time than um, the letters about the Arthur Peach murder and trial. And it takes quite a bit of, um, I, you know, when I began trying to research these events, I would about these few days in 1638. And then because I love to read, I would always just keep reading the next part of the book, um, just because I couldn't put it down. And, um, you know, these were um, letters that had been transcribed, journal entries, and I would end up reading the entire volume, and then the next volume, and then the next volume. And that's how I started to piece things together, because you can't just read, even though I'm writing about a few days in 1638, I had to read everything, everything I could get my hands on. And I just, it took about five years and I just read everything I could find and not necessarily just related about this little window in history. And um, that really ended up helping me create a fuller picture of each person in the book. And um, I wouldn't have done it except that I just enjoyed reading. So I'm, I'm lucky that kind of worked out that way. Having worked at the Winslow House before I uh, came to uh, came to Falmouth, I was uh, interested to see uh, the, the role of Edward Winslow as a as a indentured servant owner. And uh, um, you, you don't find a lot of disparaging words at, at the Winslow House. So good 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 digging by you. Um, uh, talk about the trial. How do they pick the jury? Um, how does it go? Um, and um, how were the arguments? 
Um, so picking the jury was difficult and it's very different than um, what it would look like today. So today when we think about jury service, it's completely um, uh, neutral and kind of this um, random process of who is impaneled on a jury. Um, and random is the key word. Um, at least in those initial stages. And in Plymouth Colony at this time, it was the complete opposite. Um, they were looking to find people that they felt were um, would be well suited to be thoughtful and sit on a jury and look at the evidence, not be swayed by the grumbling that was documented at the time about should um, a, a Pequot soldier, a veteran be um, be put to this trial. And there, there were those grumblings afoot within Plymouth Colony. And there was kind of this concerted effort to pull jurors who would not be prone to listening to this kind of groundswell of um, uh, possible support for Peach, but people who would be willing and capable of looking at the evidence. And that's, of course, the key to a fair jury is being able to set aside a bias or prejudice or even a preconceived idea about the evidence. And um, one of the legal scholars, um, I think from hundreds of years ago, who I, who I cite in the book, um, talks about this kind of spiritual aspect of being on a jury where um, you can see the evidence, you can the testimony, and you can um, take all of that in, but there's almost this um, uh, moral mandate that is on the shoulders of a juror. And, you know, many Americans who I, I speak to feel that it's kind of our most important um, role as a citizen and duty is to be able to serve on a jury and ensure someone has um, justice because um, it's, it really truly is kind of that solemn duty. Based on your on your research, was justice served? Based on my research, um, I don't want to give away the ending, um, but I, I will say I do think justice was served. And um, and I do think the jurors in this incredible time of subsistence living did sit down and listen to the evidence and listen to testimony that was given, not just by um, settlers, but by indigenous men who came into um, the meeting house to provide testimony at um, perceived risk to their life and maybe not just perceived but maybe indeed true risk to their life it was a time of war and they stepped in to offer um, testimony so you see a wide range of people giving testimony um, most likely in different languages and you see it all coming together in this one moment. And then the jurors stepping out of earshot and coming to a decision and a conclusion. And um, certainly I think personally, uh, my point of view is that the outcome of this trial um, helped um, kind of lead to the eventual ending of the Pequot War and um, kind of the formation of Plymouth Colony as we perceive it um post-war so it, it's an interesting period and i think um this little hidden history kind of um gives gives folks a new look at plymouth colony and about um not just plymouth colony but the indigenous people and penawan yanquis's life and and as much as possible what his his life would have been like in 1638 We know from Nathaniel Philbrick, for example, in his book, Mayflower, he writes kind of about the first generation, the second generation, and the second generation, we get into King Philip's War. But I get, I get the impression from reading your book and that in, this, in the 1630s, going to 1640, this is sort of the beginning of the end of the innocence. Is that fair to say? Um, you, know, you know, it's still first generation, but things seem to be um, fraying at the edges. Is that a fair summation? Yeah, I think that's an excellent summation and I would agree with it. And I think William Bradford, um, um, former um, Plymouth Colony governor would have agreed with that sense too and, and wrote about that feeling, kind of seeing um, what started 
at least as um, I'm not saying an actual kind of uh, religious utopia, but this attempt at something, um, a safe haven, and then whether it was um, so many different factors from mercantile to um, the all out quest for land at all costs that um, you see um, things deteriorate and then you see it kind of encapsulized in this terrible war, um, the Pequot War that unfolded. And I think sometimes that's why we don't like to turn the page of our history book and see, see the Pequot War and see what that was like. And, um, you know, if you go to the area where these battles were fought, they're often um, not on um, easily accessible maps. They're kind of hidden away. And um, I can't help but feel it's not accidental. I think these are, are painful histories that um, are, are um, hard to um, talk about and think about. But I think we, as Americans, um, can do that. We can look at every aspect of our history um, where we tried to do the right thing, where we didn't do the right thing, and we can learn from all of it. Before I let you go, I have to ask, what was it like to study at the University of Hong Kong? Oh, you're not going to believe my answer. It was during the other coronavirus pandemic. Yeah, this is actually the okay. second one. And I had, I don't know what my luck is. I was in Hong Kong during um, the first coronavirus pandemic. Um, so um, if you look at news reports from Hong Kong, this would have been about 2003, um, there was an outbreak. And um, I was happily studying international law, comparative constitutional law, human rights law. Um, and it was wonderful. And then um, the first cases were reported and then they shut down the university for a week and they said it would be one week and then that it became two weeks and then three weeks. And then you know how the story goes, it, it was a lockdown. So, um, so my time there was really unusual and, um, but it, it gave me um, kind of some tools to deal with, with this pandemic as did my research for the book because they were very familiar with um, outbreaks in 1638 and the plague and, and kind of contending with, it, with these maladies of, of our world that you know touch us in a global world um, and touch them across the sea um, via boat travel. So, um, so yeah, so that's, that's what my time was, was like. Thank you for taking the time tonight. I we greatly appreciate this. Um, you know, uh, continued success with with the with the, with this book. Do you have another one on the horizon, or is are you going to kind of let this one marinate for a while? Uh, thank you for asking. I do have an idea for another one. I'm working on a proposal about a young woman who lived in um, present day southern Maine, and I'd love to tell her story if I get the chance. Well, thank you very much for doing this. Continued good luck. Um, uh, uh, um, great success to you. And um, uh, thanks for surviving two, uh, two corona uh, out, outbreaks. Uh, so um, again, thank you for doing this. Stay safe. And thank you for joining us, everybody. Um, Toby, great to meet you. Thank you so much. It was an absolute pleasure and an honor to share this history. Thank you so much for tuning in for history. And um, again, it was a pleasure. All right. Thank you, everybody. Good night. Stay safe.